Well, hello everybody and welcome to our workshop tonight. My name is Dr. Jordan, uh, working with Liberation Chiropractic and Wellness, and tonight we're going to be talking about detoxing. And uh, when we usually think about detoxing, what do we think about? We think about juice cleanses, uh, we think about colon cleanses, liver cleanses, any organ in your body, and you can think of and throw cleanse at the end, uh, blood cleanse. And when most people think of detox, they think of that or a certain supplement or the effects of a detox, which uh, you can see the cereal here. Um, I think it was from Saturday Night Live. Uh, one of the symptoms of a detox um, that gets talked about a lot is, is digestive upset and um, reactions that happen with, with taking the supplements needed for a detox, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. Uh, when I talk about detox and think about detox, uh, I think about taking things to help my body detox, uh, which we actually do every minute of every day. We're always expelling waste, bringing in fresh nutrients to every cell, but sometimes our lifestyle, uh, as we'll learn, gets in the way of that happening. Um, anytime we're not breaking down and eliminating waste fast enough and it's just accumulating and accumulating, that's another area where the body is going to have to send the immune system and send the cells to go clean up. Uh, so we'll talk about how all these little areas that we can have um, toxins and uh, waste products build up, how they can affect the body and, and cause issues down the road. Um, symptoms of someone who needs a cellular detox. So everything here on the left, uh, long list of symptoms, and it's definitely not, in, uh, it's definitely more symptoms than this. Uh, in Western medicine, though, we tend to treat the symptom and not the individual as a whole. So these symptoms you see here are reasons to go seek out a physician, a uh, medical doctor, chiropractor, whoever. And they'll tend to, um, medical doctors will tend to look at the sin or, you know, congested sinuses and give you a, uh, a pill for your allergies. Or they'll look at your gallbladder issues and say, hey, let's take the gallbladder out. Have a seat. Yep. And so uh, I want to help you realize that these symptoms over here are not the issue. These are your body pretty much giving you your check engine light and screaming at you saying, hey, uh, you're having brain fog. Maybe we should take a look and, and address ourselves on the inside. Um, we fail to realize is that the symptoms are our body telling us that it needs our help. Uh, you wouldn't take the batteries out of your carbon monoxide sensor when it's warning you of a gas leak, but we treat our body's uh, warning signs in the exact same way. So as soon as we get one of these symptoms to go away, we forget about it, we move on, right, until the next symptom shows up. And we can't talk about an unhealthy cell until we address a healthy cell. And you can see this little guy is a cell in the body. These make up your tissues. These tissues make up your organs, and the organs make up your individual organ systems and that makes up the organism, or us. And you can see within the cell we have all these little organelles, and each of these have their own specific function. Um, some cells that need to produce more energy will have more mitochondria, for example. Some cells lack a nucleus, but uh, the, the key here is that when you have all these organelles working um, to their optimum potential, you will have a healthy cell. And they have many processes to contain, eliminate, and even recycle debris pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and uh, DNA, misfolded proteins, things like that. So when the cell can recognize that it's got something going on, it can address it and either eliminate it or break down like a misfolded protein or, or a mitochondria that's, that's overactive, like in cancer, and it will take that, break it down, and reuse it uh, to make healthy cells or healthy organelles. Uh, the most important part of the cell uh, I don't think it's just my opinion, it's the uh, cell membrane. So it's arguably the most complex part of the cell. This is that wall that surrounds the cell here. It's made of something called a phospholipid bilayer right there. And what that is, is you have the um, fluid that sits outside the cell and the fluid within the cell, and they're both water soluble. Um, these tops of the bilayer, the phospho, or the phosphorus in the phospholipid bilayer, is water soluble as well. The inside here is uh, lipids and glycerol, um, so it is fat soluble. And so you have this double walled uh, area that is real uh, picky about what passes through. And so you have channels, you have uh, these signaling molecules out here that will attach to something floating around in the fluid and then allow other molecules in. Um, a good example of this 
and we're not going to talk about that picture, but I wanted to show you, this is uh, an example is insulin floating around in the blood and uh, telling the cell it connects here and then allows sugar to pass in and out of the cell or into the cell. There is a lot going on there, but that's just sugar and insulin. So uh, it's very, very complex. And uh, as you can see, when you have these functioning properly, um, you have normal metabolism, normal um, anabolism as well. So breakdown and buildup of uh, good and bad materials. So we're gonna talk about the unhealthy or the inflamed cell. <laughs> so the inability of the cell to allow the correct nutrients and waste to pass in and out of the bilayer uh, can lead to a deficiency of key nutrients or a uh, abundance of toxins within the cell. And in the 1980s, a study uh, called the National Human Adipose Tissue Survey found that everyone who sent in a sample of their fat or had, had fat taken out and analyzed, which was 1,377 participants, uh, everyone had traces of industrial solvents and dioxins. In order to keep these toxins from roaming freely and damaging organs, our body can take these and store the toxins in fat cells. And a good example of this, of toxins being stored in fat cells, if you think about someone who's, who's losing a lot of weight at one time that's having symptoms of a, of a detox, or anyone who is going through a detox that involves weight loss, some of these, uh, these, these damaging toxins can actually get into the bloodstream and give you a little bit of an adverse reaction. Um, I found that interesting though, that every single person, and this was from age 13 all the way up to, uh, I think it was like 65, they, everyone had uh, industrial solvents and dioxins, probably from their food, we can assume. Um, so unhealthy or inflamed cells are in distress due to constant bombardment from a variety of negative factors. Cancer is an example of a cell where there's extensive mitochondrial damage and the cell begins to ferment glucose uh, rapidly without oxygen. Usually oxygen is needed to make energy for the cell, but when you have a cell with a dysfunctional mitochondria, in this case cancer, it will just rapidly take sugar and just make energy and energy and energy and reproduce. And there's, no, there's nothing telling it to stop. It'll just continue to grow. Um, scans show glucose consumption much higher in cancer. And so I, I think it was a, maybe a PET scan. They will find cancer. You can see it in a thermography. It's just a red area that's metabolically more active. Um, I know we personally recommend thermography scans over mammographies. Um, so instead of exposing you to more radiation, they'll just scan your body for temperature changes and they can actually find breast cancer so uh, that's growing. So each place that's dark red, it's bright red or whatever. It's more metabolically yeah. active. You can't call it cancer, right? Right. You can just you say, can it's, say that, you know, it's, those, should be, those areas should probably be looked at. Right, but if you're just like, could be, if you just worked out really hard, you know, and you maybe strain the muscle, it's going to be inflamed too. So oh, okay. you can't just like one-to-one -one there, but yeah. Okay. Um, so too much cellular damage within the body and we will struggle to keep up. There is a Chinese torture uh, that they uh, used to do over there. And I think they stopped early 1900s. So fairly recent called death of a thousand cuts and cellular um, toxins and buildups are not a big deal. They happen all the time several areas of the body. Your body can usually recognize it, clean it up, and be done with it. When we're constantly bombarding things and, and ingesting things and making our job harder, uh, and we'll talk about why in a second, um, there's this theory called death of a thousand cuts. And so your immune system is having to be split up between every area that it's dealing with, and so it can't effectively deal with each one individually, if that makes sense. Uh, what causes these cuts within the body? Dr. Tiffany, what are the three T's? So yes, thoughts, traumas, and toxins. Um, these issues within cells are caused by, majority of the time, these three things, mostly toxins. And uh, if you know, that's D.D. Palmer over there. That's the founder of chiropractic. Uh, so we're going to talk about thoughts first. Um, the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic nervous system. So our autonomic or automatic nervous system that we don't have to think about it, just it's one or the other is the, uh, it's split into two groups, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Our parasympathetic is our rest, digest, feed, breed. So when we're relaxed, chilled out, we'll have the parasympathetic nervous system functioning at a higher rate. If we're stressed out, we'll have the sympathetic nervous system working at a higher rate. And you can see your reaction on each side here. Um, if you had a, a parasympathetic reaction, <laughs> Uh, you're more likely to have, you're salivating, your heartbeat's slowed, it's relaxed. Um, 
digestion's better versus if we are sympathetic dominated or if we're stressed out, we're gonna inhibit our own digestion. It's, it's actually gonna draw blood away from our digestive organs and put it into our skeletal muscle. So we might be a little stronger. Uh, you know, our senses might be a little bit more acute, but our digestion's gonna lack. And um, negative thoughts and stress adversely impact the absorption of nutrients and elimination of waste products within the body. And uh, stress can cause norepinephrine release as both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. So it'll get released between nerve cells as well as get released into the blood by the adrenals that sit on top of the kidneys. And it'll increase the blood to the skeletal muscle, decrease the blood to the colon and stomach, increase your heart rate and raise blood sugar, which is great if you're trying to run away from a tiger or fight off an attacker, right? You're gonna demand that energy and you're not gonna to wanna to digest lunch while you're trying to live. Um, so, stressed every day about traffic, politics, the news, family, friends, money, your appearance, social media, the future or past, a work deadline, car or home maintenance, and or other people's actions, your body will have the exact same reaction. And I'm sure we all know people who are just excessively stressed all the time. Um, they are more likely to be a sympathetically dominated person. And uh, we... Uh, Thoughts play a major part in this because when you're constantly stressed and constantly pulling away blood from vital organs, the organs are gonna lack uh, nutrients and um, they can go and undergo hypoxia, they can undergo uh, cell death because they're not being used as much. And so it is really important to help control our thoughts, manage stress better, um, not so much get motivated versus try and make lifestyle changes to be more mindful as well to help bring us to a parasympathetic state of mind. And uh, chiropractic as well. So chiropractic adjustments, all the time we see people come in with symptoms of sympathetic dominance. And um, there's chiropractors who only will adjust the top bone in the uh, spine there, the atlas, just for to help control the vagus nerve here. And we've had patients get adjusted, blood pressure will drop 10, 15 points right after their adjustment. Um, we've had them say they can sleep the full night after their first adjustment. Uh, it's a good idea to get your spine checked out uh, just so we can make sure that a lot of your sympathetic dominance isn't due to just being subluxated or having your spine out. Moving on, our next T is traumas. A little bit smaller of a category here. Um, some examples of traumas can include compression, uh, ischemia or hypoxia in, in this example on the right. So some clots have blocked blood from making their way to cells, and so the cells are beginning to die off. Uh, we have major physical injury, and even minor physical injury. If you, if you were to pinch your skin and it turns red, that's an inflammatory response, right? So those cells are repairing that pinch. Um, it's pretty cool. And then uh, temperature extremes as well can cause cell death. Toxins. Uh, by far the longest list, and this is not a complete list, these are uh, just a couple things here, and I'm gonna point out some major ones that we're probably exposed to uh, almost every day, especially on the standard American diet. We have BPA, which is a, uh, known to cause fertility and hormone issues. A lot of things now you see that are, are BPA-free, right? Well, they've moved on to something called BPS, and BPS is a known potent obesogen. Um, so if you see things labeled BPA-free, just know it's probably got BPS, unless it's from a reputable company. Um, what exactly does that do? What happens if you, I mean like. So an obesogen, it's gaining weight, right? So it'll, it's, it's known to cause you to gain weight. Okay. Oh, wow. And next is a BT toxin. This comes from genetically modified pollen that's been shown to affect babies through the umbilical cord. Um, BT toxin is, uh, I think it stands for bacillo, it's, it's the name of a bacteria. So they've genetically modified and usually see it associated with corn, so corn, non-organic corn, to produce this pollen that when an insect bites it, their stomachs explode. So it's a great pesticide, but it's in our corn, right? So we're eating this corn, we're not insects, uh, we could probably handle a lot more, but uh, what's not taken into account is bioaccumulation within our bodies. And uh, another thing, another, another issue with this corn is we now have farmers who are growing organic corn but when bees pollinate someone else's corn who's growing the BT corn and it moves onto their property, right, they're now gonna have this pollen producing corn and these organic farmers are being sued for producing a patented product of Monsanto 
And uh, so they're now getting in legal trouble because they can't, you know, they're having a fight against the pollinators, I guess. But So basically, you'd have to grow your own corn and the bee from a... If there's a bee that's going to pollinate, right, the genetically modified corn and then make its way, way over to your corn... Then it's going to... Right. It, it, it's gonna yeah. give, and that's going to outcompete your corn. Yours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, moving on, glyphosate. That's a real popular one. Roundup ready. Uh, you see Roundup sold in stores still. Uh, there was a, about eight years ago, a $250 million lawsuit um, against Monsanto who made that. And um, it had given a man cancer who was spraying it at a schoolyard. I believe he worked for a school. But glyphosate is, is awful. <laughs> um, a lot of celiacs are, or a lot of people are di being diagnosed as, a, as having celiac disease, which is unable to digest gluten. They travel over to Europe where glyphosate is illegal, and they're able to eat the wheat over there. Uh, we see that all the time. And so what we could be looking at instead of a, a celiac epidemic is more of a, of a glyphosate intolerance within our population. Uh, it's also found in soy and GMO-ready crops. So uh, the reason it's used is because when the field is ready to sow, instead of uh, cutting and letting it all ferment and letting it all ripen at the same time, if you just spray the whole field, kill it all, uh, all of your wheat will be ready at the same time. So it's convenient, right? And less waste. Less waste. Yeah. Yep. And uh, if your crops are uh, Roundup ready, as some soy is, they'll spray the whole field to kill everything except for the soy. They've made the soy intolerant, so they've genetically modified the soy. It'll still take it up into its roots. It'll be in the plant, but uh, it won't kill the soy, so it'll help yields for those as well. Um, terrible stuff. Preservatives in food. Uh, vegetable oils are highly toxic as well. Um, a note about vegetable oils. If you consume them, your body will use fats either way into your own cell membranes. And we're speculating a little bit, but Dr. Mike and I and uh, Dr. Tiffany have talked about oils in the body and the sun hitting it, so UV radiation and, um, and sunburn. So I've noticed once I've started eating cleaner, and Dr. Mike as well, and I'm sure you have as well, sunburn isn't a thing. Like you might get red, but you're not the next day laid up in bed or you're having to put aloe on, right? My thinking is when you consume less vegetable oils, which are already liquid at, at room temperature anyways, um, they won't get uptaked or taken into the cells, and so there'll be less of an inflammatory response when the sun hits you. And so I'm beginning to think that a sunburn is more like a toxic shock syndrome or a, a symptom of consuming too many of these vegetable oils. And if you don't know if you're consuming them, you are, right? If you order anything fried, um, even, even grilled stuff in restaurants, they're probably cooking with vegetable oil. And the main issue is they're high in omega-6s. Uh, everyone knows omega-3, 6. There is an omega-9 as well. Uh, we want to have a balance here. And most of America has a balance of 10 to 1. 10 omega-6s to 1 omega-3. Uh, we want to be a lot closer to 3 to 2, uh, 5 to 1 at least. But uh, most of us have 10 times too much omega-6 fatty acids. So main thing to stay away, um, vegetable oils, processed sugars, artificial sweeteners, which can act um, as neurotransmitters, um, especially aspartame, medications or injections. Breast implants are awful. They'll leach plastic into the blood. Storing food in plastic containers, especially while it's warm. Uh, mercury fillings, we know those leach into the blood as well and have been associated with same side cancer, um, especially within uh, females for breast cancer. Uh, makeup products can be tricky. Uh, I don't personally use them very often, but uh, they can have fillers as well and contaminants. Sunscreen is a big issue. Uh, can have oxybenzone, which I know a lot of them are now labeling their sunscreen as oxybenzone free. Um, so I'm glad to see that switch, but there are other compounds within conventional sunscreen. Heavy metal exposure and mold within houses, off-gassing from furniture, cleaning products, and uh, we also have engine exhaust, uh, drinking alcohol, and aluminum foil used in cooking. So if you cook your potato in aluminum foil or store your food in aluminum foil, um, leaching aluminum into your food, which you're then consuming. Arsenic exposure, ionizing radi radiation, air pollution, tobacco. And uh, next is a group of plant toxins. And I'm not against eating plants at all. Let me preface, but there are some of us who are sensitive to certain, um, certain compounds found in plants. So plants don't have teeth. They can't fight you off. They can't run away. 
uh, all they can do is produce a compound to deter from eating it, right? So if it's bitter, if it's, if it's um, got some kind of toxin to help fight off people trying to consume it. Uh, usually these are found in, if they're in fruits, they're going to be in the seeds. So if you think of um, apple seeds, for example, I, I believe they're high in cyanide. Um, but other examples are aflatoxins. This is more of a mold that's found on peanuts, peanuts and peanut butter. And if it's not organic, even some organic peanut butter will have a, uh, a loud amount of aflatoxin. But uh, it is a mycotoxin or a mold that will grow on the peanuts pretty frequently. Lectins are from beans, wheat, soy, and tomatoes. Uh, you have oxalates. These are real spiky crystals found in a lot of leafy greens. Uh, isothiocyanates are in cruciferous vegetables. Uh, you have toxins that shellfish, uh, you know, they filter the water and they'll leave the toxin within their body and we consume that. Uh, cyanogenic glycosides are in some stone fruits, mostly the seeds, um, almonds and cassava, and uh, furocumarins, citrus par parsnips and celery. In the citrus, it's mostly in the peel and uh, we don't eat that anyway. And solanines and charconin is, uh, or ch caconin is tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants. So you see a lot of nightshades. Um, fruit seeds contain a high quantity, which we don't consume anyway. And uh, wheat and soy are, are the main uh, offenders here. Can I ask a question about cyanide? Yeah. <clears throat> why, do they, why do some say, and even some reputable you know, um, doctors and naturopathics um, say that uh, cyanide like it's in apricot seeds, um, it's good to eat if you have cancer. So does that mean a little bit of cyanide's not bad, or? Um, so, do you know which, it's like local doctors? No, so no, so no, I, like my, people who've read, you know, written books and stuff okay. like that, yeah. Okay, they're probably talking about something called hormesis, and the body can take these toxins in small amounts, and either adapt, so you can become more tolerant to these if you introduce them right more and more, or your body can take the compounds that the plant was using as a defense, and your body can use it. Uh, and I believe that's probably what they're getting at. Cyanide is cytotoxic, right? And cells, cancer cells, or cancer is cells, so. Right, okay. Probably addressing that. Okay. <clears throat> and there are thousands more. Um, just look at the back of your shampoo bottle. I'm sure half of those are, are toxins here. I'm not telling you to get rid of everything. Uh, we'll address later, you know, that exhaustive list and, and what to do about it. But I want to get on to how cells fight back. And so this is something you can't help. It's happening, you know, you, it, it's happening inside you right now. Uh, they have their own processes for removing toxins that we come into contact with every day. Um, an example, there are proteases, which break down damaged or unwanted, unwanted proteins into amino acids. There are um, enzymes that can tag older faulty organelles for removal. And remember those, the organelles are the little, little organs in the cell. And uh, they can be hauled off by something called a lysosome where they're broken down into their basic materials and reused again. And uh, glutathione, we've all probably heard, or, or a, a lot of us probably have, it's the master detoxifier within our body. Uh, it's produced as needed to detoxify. Taking glutathione orally though is completely ineffective because uh, your stomach acid will break it down. So you need to give your body the, the building blocks to produce glutathione, which is three amino acids, uh, glycine, glutamate, and cysteine. Um, an example of, of use of glutathione in the medical field is uh, when I worked at a hospital, we would use N-acetylcysteine to combat Tylenol overdose or any major liver damage. And uh, you can get the same effects by supplementing. The main one to focus on here is cysteine, but glycine and glutamate as well. Your body can produce them in limited quantities. They're not a completely essential amino acid, but um, you can definitely bolster your glutathione levels by taking more. And when all else fails, the uh, cell can spit out the toxin through exocytosis. It forms it in a little fat layer and pushes it out through that fat bilayer bi that we talked about earlier. Or it can set it aside and store it within the cell body or within fat cells. Um, if you have too much junk and debris within a cell, the cell will simply die or it'll have to mutate. And I want to get into how we can begin to fight back. Uh, first thing first, you need to educate yourself. Figuring out the most prominent sources of cell dysfunction within your own life is the first step to eliminate them. 
So with that first, um, or that long exhaustive list, I'm sure we all saw maybe one or two that we probably come into contact with pretty often. Um, it, it's about pinpointing those areas and maybe cutting back or, or making a change uh, with that you know, certain toxin that you're coming in, into exposure with. Um, this is the step that does involve the most effort. So you're gonna have to wanna change, right? You, are you, you, you're gonna get real excited about this and maybe you want your spouse to change and they're not gonna wanna do it. So it, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of um, getting excited and motivated. And you need to educate yourself while you're motivated uh, because the motivation will wear off. But if you know why what you're avoiding is toxic in the first place, you'll stay true to your convictions. And education helps to alter lifestyle, but there also needs to be a willingness to confront the comfort or convenience. Uh, a good example of this is K-cups. If you're drinking K-cups with the little plastic containers and the tinfoil top, right, and you're running the hot water through the K-cup, um, source of plastics leaching into hot water, and uh, it's very convenient, though, to just pop a cake up and press a button and you have your coffee. So there needs to be a willingness to um, leave your area of comfort uh, in order to get healthier. Second step is to remove. So once you've identified the source of the dysfunction in your life, find alternatives or eliminate them altogether. Every elimination allows your body to focus its efforts on a different problem. And if you see this on the left, this is a, uh, the toxins found in sunscreen. And yes, that's vitamin A. Uh, vitamin A is actually phototoxic when you put it on your skin. And so if you rub vitamin A all over you and then go lay out in the sun with UV radiation, um, which the sun is great for you, by the way. I'm not saying it's bad. But with phototoxic chemicals or some essential oils even can be phototoxic, um, you're asking to have mutations within cell and cell damage. Um, Let's see. Trying to initiate a detox while exposing yourself to sources of toxins is counterproductive. Uh, a fire can't be put out while the fuel is being added. And so I, I compare that to also if you have a bathtub with holes in it and your goal is to fill it up, you're, you're never going to get it full or accomplish your goal while you're, you haven't eliminated the causes of the dysfunction in the first place. And that's that. And you can see um, the lectins, oxalates, and phytates talked about. And every uh, fruit or vegetable or grain in this category has a certain, it has a different level. So some foods are, are produce more defense chemicals than other. And the third part is support. So fasting is the quickest way to initiate something called autophagy. And autophagy means self-eat. It is the, uh, or one of the processes in which our cells will search out misfolded proteins and search out damaged uh, DNA and damaged organelles and actually break them down and use them to rebuild proper working uh, organelles and DNA. And products can also be added to support the detox process. And chiropractic adjustments can help return the body to a more parasympathetic state as well as mindfulness, guided meditation, and thoughtful prayer also support the autonomic nervous system. And I, I personally have a testament to guided meditation and prayer. Uh, when I was in chiropractic school, my second quarter, I decided I want to get ahead of everybody. So I decided to take uh, 32 credit hours my second quarter and, and try to get all A's. And uh, it, did, it did a number on me. I just moved to a new place, didn't know anyone. Um, I love to play soccer, and I hadn't played soccer in a very long time. And so eventually, uh, I'm susceptible to ulcerative colitis. I had no idea. And so it made an appearance, lost like 20 pounds in a month, um, couldn't eat, couldn't sit in class. And I went out to an urgent care, and they, they asked my family history and assumed diverticulitis, uh, gave me some antibiotics. It, it wasn't that. But the only thing that helped, diet, you know, touched it. Diet helped sometimes if I, if I avoided certain foods was... Um, taking some time, finding a local soccer league, doing something I enjoyed that took me out of that stress 24-7 state, and uh, guided meditation. So I found a guided meditation that I didn't think was um, too kooky, right? That's something that I, that I could get with that I didn't think was crazy. And uh, it did help, you know, the mindfulness, the, the clearing out your mind, just 10 minutes a day really, really did help. 
Oh, and it got better and it never came back. So it did help for sure. So fasting. Um, I love to talk about fasting. Uh, it's much better than calorie restriction for muscle prevention. And those who are metabolically flexible do way better while fasting. Um, that means that if you are more adapted to burning fats versus carb dependent, so if, you've, if you need carbs every meal or if you, you have blood sugar dips throughout the day, um, you're a little bit more metabolically inflexible. And it's, that's not a bad thing. That's just how you tend to burn fuel versus how do other you people. Find out which one you are? Just don't eat and see yeah. your reaction. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, have you done keto? So you're probably a little bit more metabolically flexible. You did okay? I felt awful okay. at first. At first? So that was you adapting to burning fat but for fuel. I, I was good after that. And you were good. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's it. So the body's been running on sugar for so long, and then you cut off the fuel. It has to figure out how to use fat to make ketones, and the body has to run on ketones. Um, it can also make sugar from fat through gluconeogenesis, but it has to, it has to really need it, right? So you had all those symptoms, those cravings. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll say, they'll say take electrolytes. They'll say all this, hydrate. But until I you're... I almost felt like I was detoxing. Mm -hmm. Headache, nausea. Just I felt like I got ran over by a truck. Yeah, I, I'm sure it does a little bit. But uh, while eating carbs, you release insulin. And insulin will block a uh, hormone called leptin. Leptin tells you when you're full. And uh, if you think about it, our ancestors, if they found a source of carbohydrates, which would probably be um, a fruit tree or some berries, uh, this signaling pathway would be needed in order to consume as much food as possible and add some weight for survival. So if you think about um, you know, the, the way insulin is released is through that sugar, and so they're just going to keep consuming, consuming, consuming. And uh, yeah, it's a good way to pack on some pounds. If you see here on the right, it's what happens to your body during fasting. Uh, within eight hours, your blood sugar falls and insulin's no longer being produced and released if you've gone eight hours without eating. Uh, food consumed will be burned at 12 hours and human growth hormone increases at 12 hours, uh, which is great at preserving muscle as well as uh, adding muscle mass. Uh, at 16 hours of not eating, your body will ramp up fat burning pathways in order to produce the energy that you need to keep you alive. And at 18 hours, human growth hormone starts to skyrocket. And at 24 hours, that's what we were looking for is autophagy. And uh, draining all glycogen. So glycogen is stored sugar in the liver. That will be drained by this point. But the autophagy is when your body starts to fix the broken areas. And uh, instead of just disposing broken organelles, it'll actually repair and, and create properly running organelles. Uh, 36 hours, you can see autophagy will increase by 300%. Two days of fasting, the immune system resets uh, to reduce the inflammatory response. And at 70, 72 hours, you will max out. Um, and there's really the other benefit of fasting longer than this is weight loss. But as far as autophagy goes, uh, you pretty much max out at uh, 72 hours there. So if you're carb dependent or have not been into ketosis for a long time, fasting will be tough until the body can switch to using ketones effectively. Ketones prevent muscles from being broken down. According to a 1989 study, growth hormone helps increase bone density and increase muscle mass. And there are some other benefits here. You can see slow, slows cell aging. Um, that happens through something uh, called AGE. So advanced glycated end, end products are not produced. And these, these actually age your body and your cells as well as you have an increase in something called telomere length. And you can think of telomeres like, um, they call it the aglet on the end of a shoelace. The little plastic part on the end of your shoelace, it'll cap the DNA. And so that has been linked to long, longevity as well, if you have lengthy telomeres. And uh, those naturally get smaller as we age, but when we fast, uh, they tend to retain their length a little bit better. Um, some other benefits. Uh, metabol metab metabolic rate will actually speed up, up to 72 hours after fasting. And the, there are neuroprotective effects as well, including uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor. So that is uh, a hormone that releases and will actually increase brain growth. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So our ancestors, if they're starving and haven't eaten in, in 72 hours, if they don't get out of their, you know, if you think they lived in caves or if they don't get out and go search for food and go hunt and go find nourishment, they will die. So the body has protective effects. It'll help you learn from your mistakes and uh, increase healing in the brain. 
uh, in order to go out and find out what works, you know, get your food, get your nourishment. And another great benefit of fasting is it resets uh, something called ghrelin. And this leptin was the satiety hormone, ghrelin is the hunger hormone. The higher this is, the hungrier you are. And this will peak based on your normal eating habits. So if you're used to eating three times a day, you'll have three ghrelin peaks a day. If you're used to eating six times a day, like we've been told for weight loss, um, you'll have six peaks a day. Okay. One more page about fasting. Uh, this is Angus Barberi. He did a 382 day fast in 1965. He went from 456 pounds to 180 and consumed only vitamins, electrolytes, and occasionally yeast for essential amino acids. And uh, I want to give some tips here. If you're going to fast, use your muscles. Even if, you must, uh, even if you have to go for a walk, let your body know it still needs to continue to hold on to the muscle tissue. Your body will create its own glucose through what we talked about, gluconeogenesis. So blood sugar will not crash unless you're metabolically inflexible and or you have a medication like metformin to help control your blood sugar. And hunger disappeared in a study for 93.2% of people as ghrelin dropped after their fourth day in a four to 21 day fast. Uh, this was in 2019. During the same study, 84% of people improved their pre-existing health conditions. And there was one lady, for example, she cured her diabetes within two weeks of fasting and while she regained all the weight shortly after, the diabetes stayed in remission for over a year. And Upton Sinclair, uh, whatever you might think about him, he also wrote a book called The Fasting Cure. And uh, at the time, I, Upton Sinclair, you either have a, a positive or negative opinion about him, but he wrote The Fasting Cure pretty much as a cure-all. And so he talks about different ailments that get better uh, within that book. I think it was written in like 19... 1908 was real early. But fasting should stop before the body fat drops to unsafe levels, as this could trigger the body to begin to enter starvation mode and break down muscle tissue. And uh, some other negative effects of fasting too long is you could have a, uh, even though you might be losing body fat, you could be losing visceral fat as well, the fat around the organs, which is really, really important. And um, you'll know, you'll start having, start having muscle breakdown as well, but we don't need to lose the fat around our organs. Uh, we, I, I've read about one study, a lady did um, die after eating again, uh, after fasting for over 200 days, but she had fasted so long to where her heart had atrophied. And uh, she didn't need to be fasting. She didn't have any weight to lose at that point. And uh, yeah, so she, when she re refed herself, her heart wasn't strong enough and, and she had a heart attack. And they also talk about, after fasting, the refeeding process. Start with something small. Um, you know, don't fast for two weeks and then go out and eat a hamburger and, you know, and french fries and everything. You want to start with like some bone broth or a handful of almonds or, or something light just to get back into eating. And then uh, you can start adding, adding back in the foods. I believe his first meal after fasting that long was um, an egg and a piece of toast. And uh, he's quoted as saying, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my egg and I'm sufficiently full after 382 days. Wow. Second, get outside. So positive ions, which are not great, are generated from anything with an electromagnetic uh, capability, such as electronic devices, uh, fluorescent lighting, carpet, upholstery, curtains, paint, air pollution, and some weather changes also will cause positive ions. Negative ions, on the other hand, which are good for you, so negative ions are positive, are molecules floating in the air that have been charged with electricity. And negative ions exist in nature in several places. Um, UV rays from the sun, discharges of electricity after a thunderclap or lightning, when water collides with itself, uh, like a waterfall or the ocean shore, and even in the shower, it's called the Leonard Lennard effect. And contacting the ground with bare feet, you can hear that, I think people call it grounding. Um, the movement of electrons into the body, right, with being in contact with the earth. And uh, mountain ranges, beautiful views, and Himalayan salt as well will release negative ions. And these are well known to improve your mood, uh, but they're also very good for your health as well. That's actually my last hike there in, uh, last year up in uh, Washington. Wow. But yeah, just that, that feeling of, of being out there and being in the sun, I mean, you guys know if you lay out at the beach, you feel good, mm -hmm. right? unless you're there too long. But. Yeah. Third, 
I want to talk about a little bit of uh, some products here. So we'll start with zeolite clinoptilolite. Zeolites are um, a rock coming from volcanic lava that's been interacted with water, so groundwater or salt water, and has been compressed through thousands of years. And the word zeolite was coined in 1756 by a Swedish mineralogist, Axel Friedrich Kronsted, who noticed that rapidly heating a <laughs> mineral, uh, and they believe the mineral was still bite. I don't, I don't know anything about that, but they believe that was the mineral um, that he heated up, but it caused large amounts of water to actually be released that were trapped within the, in the mineral itself. And he calls this, this material zeolite, or from the Greek zeo to boil and lithos, which means stone. Natural zeolites happen where, like I mentioned, volcanic lava and rocks and ash uh, interact with alkaline groundwater or salt water. This is not an ideal source of zeolites, though, um, as they can have impurities. So they're highly negatively charged, and they have a high affinity for positively charged uh, molecules. So you don't want to just be you know, out mining for zeolite and drink that. Um, like I mentioned, it's negatively charged, and it has an... Uh, Clinoptilolite is an aluminosilicate zeolite. So if you look over here, we have the aluminosilicate or this uh, white structure here uh, within it. It's going to be bound to, uh, we have sodium, calcium, and potassium naturally just bound there. And when you ingest this supplement or ingest this mineral, it's going to have a stronger affinity for things like uh, mycotoxin, at least cesium or cesium. Uh, we have lead, mercury, it's going to naturally want to bind to more positively charged ions within the body. So it'll help you pull out metals. It'll help you detox as well from mycotoxin. And this allows it to exchange with the lesser bound elements uh, for those within the body. So you'll actually get those, uh, those trace minerals released into your body as well. It's not going to be in, in a high enough amount to make a difference, but there is another benefit to taking zeolite. Uh, this will lighten the load on your liver, kidneys, and other eliminative organs. And so they won't have to work as hard. The kidneys to, to release water-soluble and the liver to release fat-soluble toxins out of the body and so that they can focus on other areas. Activated charcoal is the second one. Really common. Uh, everyone's probably heard of this one as well. This is a commonly used binder uh, that is broad-spectrum in nature. I've personally taken it before this workshop um, for food poisoning once, and it does great. Uh, it helps kind of bind and eliminate that before it passes. Uh, but it'll also bind to beneficial vitamins and minerals. So it needs to be avoided with meals and supplements that you want to be absorbed into the body. How but long? You know, like I'd wait two hours. Mean? Wait two hours at least. Okay. I think it would depend. So if it's a more carbohydrate-rich meal, you could probably afford to do it sooner. If it's some more fat and protein that takes longer, okay. you maybe wait four to six hours. Okay. Uh, the charcoal is activated from the small holes created within its structure. It can be done physically, but a lot of times they'll just overheat it even more um, to create small porous structures within the charcoal. And if you've ever messed around with this stuff, you know, put it on your toothpaste, it gets everywhere. It gets absolutely everywhere. And if you get it on your skin, it sta stains your skin and everything. Uh, activated charcoal is negatively charged though and porous, which allows it to attract toxins to prevent their absorption into the gut lining. Activated charcoal is not absorbed as, uh, into the body, so it is able to transport the toxins out of the body safely. Humic and fulvic acids. And this is another mineral. Uh, humic acid is filled with essential minerals that have been compressed over time from decaying organic matter. And similar to that, fulvic acid is formed as a result of breakdown of organic materials within the soil. And uh, they've been proven to bind to a variety of toxins, improve endothelial function, so uh, within the cell wall, and support healthy gut microbiome. They're also a decent source of nutrients if you choose to take these two here. Uh, and in agricultural, they've been used a lot longer for binding and removal of heavy metals, pesticides, and organic pollutants, uh, and mycological agents within like runoff water and within the fields themselves. A derivative of humic acid, uh, oct octumapt, was shown to have a beneficial effect on body weight. And another study found that fulvic acid protects the liver and kidneys from medication side effects. And in this specific study, they were using a, an HIV medication, pretty potent medication. And um, those that took fulvic acid had better function from their livers and kidneys. 
Now, a supplement I would recommend if you were to take one on a detox would be something called Z Binder. And it's got uh, let's see, purified shilajit. It's an Ayurvedic powder from the rocks of the Himalayans. And this contains both, both the fulvic acid and the humic acid, as well as several different minerals. Uh, it contains activated charcoal that are actually from coconut shells. So they've taken coconut shells, which are, which are naturally antimicrobial inside anyways, and they burn them to make the charcoal, and then further burn them to make it more porous in structure. Zeolite as clinoptilolite, which is the type of zeolite, um, is sourced from a mineral-rich rich quarry uh, in Slovakia. Next, I get asked a lot about bentonite clay. And this clay got its name based on where it was mined in the US, Fort Benton, Wyoming. And bentonite clay is also a product of ash from volcanoes. It seeks toxins in the body to bind with because of its negative charge. And the benefits include expelling toxins, heavy metals. It's got antibacterial properties. I've also taken this one. I don't just get food poisoning all the time, but I've also <laughs> taken this one. Uh, upset stomach, you can have it with acid reflux, you can take it. Uh, we actually have a topical water and uh, fat-based salve. So if you have um, toxins on the skin that are water-soluble that need to get pulled out, or if you have toxins that are uh, fat-soluble that need to get pulled out, we have both of those. It's wonderful at doing its job there. And uh, it contains a range of nutrients within the clay itself. Uh, you can see it's got calcium, magnesium, silica, sodium, copper, iron, and potassium. And it binds to toxins in the alimentary canal, which is pretty much, if you think about, we got the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the colon, um, and your anus. So it covers from, from nose to tail there. And uh, it improves the purity of tap water, um, and it's great for skin and can peel impurities out of our body. And I know it's real popular with facials and such, too. So let's talk about reactions to detoxifying. 30% of people who detox will begin to feel worse uh, before they begin to feel better. And we have Dr. Herxheimer, who named the reaction of flu-like symptoms. Um, I've listed a few symptoms here. We have headache, joint and muscle pain, body aches, sore throat, general malaise or being tired, sweating, chills, nausea, and there are a whole list of other symptoms people get while detoxing. It's, it's, it seems never ending because you always hear of something else. They're like, oh, maybe I'm detoxing. Um, Dr. Herxheimer, he's named it after himself. It's called a Herxheimer reaction. Or if you see someone saying, I'm having a Herx, H-E-R-X, that's a reaction to detoxing. This is a normal reaction that indicates uh, parasites, funguses, bacteria, or fungi, bacteria, uh, viruses, or other pathogens are being killed off. Uh, a lot of these pathogens will produce endotoxins or toxins within themselves, especially bacteria. And if they're killed off all at the same time, you're going to have that big release and that big... Um, rush of toxins within your blood. And so your body's going to have to handle that. Uh, and a lot of these symptoms can be produced from the endotoxins that are released through so detoxing. So does any of that stuff that you recommend taking help when those yes. things are released? Yes, it will help. It, filter it out? So it'll help in the way that it won't go into your blood and, and, you know, and do its work there. It'll be in the colon. And so if we have, uh, the colon is, is funky. It's semi-permeable. It's at different times, it allows nutrients into your blood. And so by taking this, we can help pull back the toxins and then expel them through our you know, waste. Any of those? Yeah, I, yeah, any of these all pretty much work the same way. Okay. Yeah. And so the goal is to, to take a negatively charged, and you know silver, you've taken silver. Mm -hmm. It's negatively charged as well, I, I believe. But it's got a charge attached to it that, that goes against the viruses that you're taking it for, right, to help fight. So we're positively charged? I don't think it is. Okay. Um, I would think I so too. Know. Right, but it works the same way through. I am sorry, Mary, yeah. can I interrupt you? But when somebody's having like a lot of detox reactions, does that mean that they're like, they're like full of to uh, toxicity? So everyone has their own threshold. It depends on the state of your immune system um, as well as your toxic load. So it certainly could be, um, you know, they, they're more toxic not as a person, but they've, they've got more toxins within their body. Um, and, and people who are bigger and, or have more fluid within their body. So as you get older, we tend to get a lower level of fluid in our body. Men have more blood than women. Um, so like medications taken for me would affect me less than you. That's why I need a higher dose. 
It's the same with if you have endotoxins released in the blood. If we have the same dose being released into our blood, it would probably affect you a little bit more. Yeah, and I, I noticed that because my husband and I started um, Zeolite, and the first couple of days, like, I was having a reaction to manic and drastic, and he was mm -hmm. just like, he was fine. okay, like, nothing was happening with him. Yeah. But I thought, like, maybe I'm more screwed up with his, I don't know. It could be, and it, it could even get that your body's absorbing or using more of it. Um, you know, if, you're, if your intestines are caked with, uh, with mucus or infl and they're inflamed, uh, maybe the zeolite is not working as much versus he could just be less, less toxic. Either way. Um, the good news here. So your health is an investment, not an expense. Every little bit that you do will help the immune system and it has a multiple, multiplicative effect. Uh, this means removing a toxin or a mental stress in one area of your life will allow, um, for example, physical injuries to heal quicker, organs to function more efficiently, absorption and utilization of more nutrients, and so many other benefits to be gained by supporting your body's natural detoxing pathways. Uh, and this comes back to that um, talk about death of a thousand cuts. If you get rid of half your cuts, you only got 500, right? And so it's much easier for the immune system to focus on less problems um, versus having to address all the inflammation within the body. And your body and cells want to do what's best with you, uh, what's best for you. It's our job to remove the lifestyle interferences that prevent health from being expressed. And do we have any questions? Yeah. Okay. You were talking about the plants. Mm -hmm. When you eat certain plants, they release certain things as a, as a defense mechanism, and those things could be toxic. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so what would you say for people who cure their cancer through diet and the, their majority of their diet is plants? Right. I think let food be thy medicine is the founder of modern medicine, Hippocrates, was his saying. And I believe in using these toxins, so to speak, from the plants as medicine. I think that, okay. right, they're, they're cytotoxic in nature anyway. Um, like the like isothiocyanates and, and cruciferous vegetables, yeah. uh, we can handle a certain amount, right? And it's beneficial to us. And then if we, we can keep consuming over and over, like oxalates, kidney stones, right? If you're someone who's metabolically, um, what's the word? If, you, if you're not, if you're susceptible to kidney stones and you consume oxalates, if your kidney stones are caused by a calcium oxalate, that's, that's right. an example right there, right? Right, okay. So basically too much of anything not a good thing. Yeah, and, and certain... It's a balance. It is a balance. And I have a theory that wherever your ancestors are from, um, so if you are someone who's more equatorial and, uh, you know, maybe from Mexico, you would thrive better on a more uh, plant-based diet or agricultural diet, right? Because our an their ancestors probably were able to grow everything, right? Versus a northern Inuit who um, lived off of fish, salmon. Um, their whole life, that's all they eat, right? They don't grow vegetables. They just live off of fish and meat. Um, they would thrive better on that diet. And there was actually a researcher, uh, I can't tell you the year, who had traveled up to live with the northern Inuits, and they had eaten, I think, polar bear once, polar bear, and uh, they lived off of salmon. And he said they were the healthiest people he ever knew, right? And so they never had vitamin D. They never got exposed to the sun. They got all their nutrients from these fish and polar bear. But so I guess... The book, uh, Eat Right for Your Blood Type, is... I don't know. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm not saying that. I think more ancestral. I don't think blood type has anything to do with okay. ancestor. Mm. Okay. Right. Well, your ancestors be more of your DNA. Yeah, it'd be where you, where you came from and their lifestyle habits. Right. Okay. Mm. Any other questions? Um, is there a certain brand of zeolite that you... I'm going to be taking this orthomolecular, okay. but I've used Coceva TRS. Is that the one? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's a real popular one. Um, okay. That's multi-level marketing, I believe. But so that kind of rubs me the wrong way. But okay. it worked. It worked. The, I took it at one night. It's a spray bottle. You spray your mouth two to three times a night. And um, I had night sweats the first night. And then I actually dreamed for the first time in a long time. So. I Yeah. Me was more like an upset stomach. Oh, okay. Yes. I had a I had a patient who their um, occupational therapist 
uh, had had recommended it for her child who has autism. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided to buy a three pack for me to try and, and her to try. And I gave the other one to someone who I think has a mold toxicity. But um, it, it works. It's worked. Yeah. I still use it. And I started like a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. But now I just do like two or three straight for a break. And they say the longer you take it, the more affinity it'll have for different metals. So like lead, for example, won't get pulled at the same time as copper. There are, there are certain metals that get pulled first before the next one. And I can't tell you which ones yeah, get pulled first. I know that for my aluminum ones. Pull all at one time. No, a different positively charged chemicals, in this case for the zeolites, will have a, a different affinity, right? And so think about like a strong magnet versus a weak magnet. It'll, it'll bind to the strong right. one first, eliminate it, and then... And then go hmm. to the next. And then oh. But that's a combination of different... That's not just strictly... Zeolite. No, the Z binder, the Z binder is uh, zeolite, fumic, and fulvic acids, right. and then okay. activated charcoal. Okay. Yeah, and I personally. Um, so that one needs to be done not in between meals. So many hours in between meals. They say take it two hours, or sorry, not two hours. Take it in between meals. Don't take it with meals. Okay. Right. Right. Um, if if you were to go the ideal route and you could handle in your metabolically flexible fasting and taking a detox at the same time, drinking water and electrolytes, I'd help supplement that. When I say fast, I mean like two days. Um, are you still on your strictly meat? Mm -hmm. You are? Mm -hmm. Getting how, blood work Monday. How is that going? It's still good. good? Yeah. It's good. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the carnivore diet, guys. Okay. Two months. <laughs> Any other questions? And you mm -hmm. fast, right? You fast uh, and you... During the week, it's one meal a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I'm not dead, so it's great. But you also don't have female hormone fluctuations. Yeah, that is another factor to consider. So um, blood sugar is not all about weight loss and everything, right? And liver health is extremely important for, uh, for processing female hormone metabolites and such. I, I, I'm not, I, I, just, I feel bad because I feel like diet is a little harder for women, and I do believe that y'all are affected by like Z. A lot harder. Right. And, <laughs> I, I believe women are a little bit more susceptible to the toxins, you know, in plastic and the xenoestrogens and things like that. And y'all use um, skincare products, and so it's it's hard to find clean example of those, right? Y'all carry the emotional burden. Okay, so like fifty percent more fat or like something like that, so it seems to be like the most Um. So one last question. Um, we have the whole detox thing down, but how do we, where, where do we start for knowing what we should and shouldn't be eating um, for maintenance, not only just weight loss, but maintenance as well? So I can't, I can't prescribe everyone. Right. Right. That would be a, based on a individual. Right. right. But you can't just go to a dietitian because you don't know. Right. You right. know what I'm saying? So, so my go-to would be um, recommending the advanced plan, the core plan. These are the ketogenic protocols that we recommend that do include vegetables. In that but, packet that y'all give out? Yes. Whenever you, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, and if you're not successful on a ketogenic diet, if you just, it's been a week and you still have your cravings, um, you're not in ketosis or it's not working for you, you can start looking other places. You know, I've, I've done okay. vegan for a year um, and now I'm doing the opposite. So oh, okay. you have to kind of figure out what works for you. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming out, everybody. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'm going to be sticking around and also enjoy, I believe, a certain percent off uh, the products today. So uh, we'll be here if you want to get anything from the store. Thanks. <laughs>